I'm going to turn it over now to our uh, professionals to do the uh, heavy lifting. Uh, we have an agenda. Uh, you'll see uh, that agenda on, uh, uh, on the PowerPoint. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the basics, uh, talk about the parties and the documentation that's required to do these deals. We're going to talk a little bit about market structure, uh, market structures for doing these. Uh, we'll go through a timeline, uh, look at some of the bond costs, and finally end up talking about how you apply for our application process. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started, and uh, I'll let you guys take it from here. Thank you, yes. we are We are just going to sit at the desk, so I'm... I apologize. I'm already short enough. I apologize. <laughs> um, just to sort of reiterate some of what Daryl has said, um, you know, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, there will be a question and answer session um, after this is over or towards the end. And you know, we're we're, we're going to stay here as long as uh, as long as folks want to talk. So there's no there's no rush in that respect. Um, the other thing is is that you know I'm looking out at the crowd and I see developers that we've done deals with. I, I know that there's other developers out there that we have not done transactions with, and I know that there's some developers out there that perhaps have not bond, done a bond 4% transaction. So by, by definition, our, our, um, what we're going to talk about is going to be somewhat general in nature. We could probably get into the little bit of the weeds on some issues to the extent that you have some questions, uh, but we're always willing to follow up, whether it's today, after the sessions, or even afterwards. Daryl has our contact information, and actually I think it's... It's, it's in the agenda materials as well, so you're, you're free to sort of follow up with any of us at any time you want. I think the starting point, um, and this one, as Daryl mentioned, this is going to be geared more towards 4% tax credits. Um, there are two types of tax credits that Lewis will get into later, 4% uh, tax credits and 9% tax credits. The difference between the two, in addition to the, um, the obvious where, you know, there's more equity on a 9% deal, the, but one of the primary differences between the two is, is that in order for 4% tax credits to be issued, you have to issue tax exempt bonds. Um, and so our first, uh, our first discussion is, is a bond and what is it? And I'm sure that you guys have all heard of bonds. Uh, but basically a bond is sort of like a note, uh, a loan. It's a debt in instrument in which an investor loans money uh, to an entity, which would be, in this case, Oklahoma Housing Finance Agency. Um, and then those, those funds are used and passed along to the borrower, loaned to the borrower for the, for the purpose, in this case, of uh, building housing. It's really conceptually no different than going to the bank and getting a loan. And there's, a, there's an instrument called a note that you all are familiar with. So it's really, it's really just sort of layering on that. But in order for us to issue bonds, we have to make sure that the state law uh, provisions are met. Uh, and then there's a federal law provision under which we have to issue these bonds so that they can be tax exempt. Um, just like anything else in life, uh, you know, if you get, in this case, if you get tax exempt bonds, if the, if the federal government says, sure, we'll, we'll let you um, issue some instruments and we won't collect interest on it, there's going to be a quid pro quo. And so we'll go through some of the quid pro quo, but essentially it's affordable housing. Um, there are many different kinds of bonds. Um, you know, uh, and, and it's primarily how governments are funded. It's, it's the government's primary borrowing mechanism. Um, what we do uh, on this slide is actually the second one, which is the condo bond. Um, and in this case, the governmental issuer, which would be Oklahoma Housing Finance, basically is a conduit for a developer to access tax-exempt bonds. Um, they don't use the proceeds themselves. The developer uses the proceeds uh, to build the project that's been approved. Um, you contrast that with other kinds of bonds that you may have heard about, which are governmental bonds, and that's basically how the government uh, builds and maintains things like schools, uh, roads, highways, sewer systems, water systems, just basic governmental services. Um, so, as part of the lingo, when we talk about bonds, and maybe when you're going away from here, you're in other, other venues, and you're talking about bonds, you'll, you'll hear the term conduit bond, and basically that's what kind of refers to us. Thank you, uh, Sue Darrell, and thank you, Darrell, for that warm introduction. I'm Mark O'Brien, Managing Director in our National Housing Group with Raymond James in our Dallas office. My friend and colleague, Tim Ranovix, is the Vice President in our National Housing Group, and we've been working for a number of years with Oklahoma HFA or OPA on these multifamily uh, mortgage revenue bond transactions. 
And I just want to thank staff for the opportunity to be here to, to give you this information. Uh, it's been a wonderful relationship. We do these deals for state and local housing finance agencies like OPA all over the country. And uh, this is a really fine group you've got here at OPA in terms of the board, in terms of the staff, in terms of the professional team. Uh, they really make these deals easy to do. So uh, I, I know Sue you've echoed that. This is a, a great group to work with, and they're here to help you get your deals done and house more, get more projects done and get more uh, low mod uh, renter, renters into your properties. So thanks for that. And I think the other reason, uh, Daryl, why Daryl asked me to be here, number one, we've been doing these pro projects since 2014 for Oklahoma HFA. Uh, so that's one reason I ran James here. Second is I'm an Oklahoma City native. And third, most importantly, like Daryl, I'm a recovering lawyer. So I'll, 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 I'll leave the details to, to, to Sujo and Lewis and Alexander this time. But but happy to be back in Oklahoma City, so thank you all for that opportunity. Uh, basically, the tax exempt housing bonds, the advantages, of course, is just a lower cost of borrowing. So for example, in, in the uh, to reduce the all-in borrowing rate for your project, if a investor has a 33% marginal tax rate, uh, a six seven percent taxable bond will give them the same uh, return effectively as a seven as a four point six nine percent tax exempt bond. So that's the main thrust of what we're doing here is issuing tax exempt debt, underwriting on behalf of the issuer in order to lower your borrowing costs. As as we'll get into in, in more detail, the real thing that you're getting here by issuing these bonds sometimes they're just short term tax exempt. Uh, bonds that are going to be outstanding several years. The real reason to go through that time and expense is, as Daryl said, to get the free money, the equity for your project, the 4% tax credits, which should be able to provide 25 to 30% of equity for your uh, and total cost for your total project cost for your development. And this is a space where where there is a catch. It, it, it's just not automatic. You, you don't just go issue bonds and say, okay, you got your tax credits. Um, the, the bonds have to be part of your permanent plan of financing. So you, you can't just issue construction period bonds. Uh, it's got to be part of your permanent plan. Now, the IRS doesn't say what that looks like. So in effect, your permanent plan of finance could be the entire construction cycle placed in service plus one day. But as we look at the deal, we have to make sure that the bonds are outstanding at least through the place in service date. The other thing is that, that when you look at your total project cost, and I, I typically tell people, look at your total project cost and think that at least 50% of it has to be financed on a permanent basis with the bonds uh, in order to qualify for the credits. Now, the test is actually a little more forgiving than that. It's aggregate basis plus land. But when, when you, you get into that, you have to start to classify your expenses. So if you just want to if you just want to handicap it, look at your total project cost, multiply by 50%, and that's the amount of bonds that you have to use. And you want to give yourself a cushion because one of the, the pitfalls that you can have is if you do 50% uh, financing with bonds, you get the credits, then you get into construction, and then China starts messing with your prices, you're halfway through the year, and you're in construction, and now your pricing's out of whack, and now your your bonds are less than 50%. So we always, we always coach our, our clients to, to look for a cushion, whether it's 55 or 60% of the aggregate basis. But that, those are the two, two big, big things that you have to hit in order to use the bond financing to qualify for the credits. And generally, a 9% credit will raise 50% more than a 4% credit. Um, one other important distinction is that states are limited in the amount of 9% tax credits they can allocate. So these are, these are, these are uh, transactions that are done that don't have tax exempt bonds. But as Daryl mentioned, when you are using 4% credits, there really isn't a limit, or at least not a direct limit, um, as long as you can get tax exempt bonds issued. For issuing these tax exempt bonds under the, the code of the which allows these bonds to be tax exempt, there are a number of requirements that you have to meet for your project and for your financing. So when you're looking at your numbers, 95% um, of the bond proceeds need to be spent on qualified costs, which are land, depreciable property, your, your hard construction costs, and then some other eligible soft costs. Um, and then not more than 25% of your proceeds can be used for land acquisition. Um, so you, when you're looking at what your bond sizing is, you have to keep these other tests in mind. Um, there's 50% the rehab requirement. There are 2% of your bonds can be spent on cost of issuance, which are your legal fees, your title fees, anything related to the issuance cost of the bonds. Um, so they limit the amount of fees that can be paid with bond proceeds. Um, oh, the average return of your bonds can't exceed 120% of your average 
reasonably expected economic life of the facilities being financed. Um, and so there's a little test that we do. And in that 15% portion is acquisition and rehab, of course, new construction, all, all we, we generally, on a tax credit project, we generally do not have a problem meeting the 15% test is by and large, you're doing at least 20,000. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Mark, uh, there's a mic right there to your right. Yeah. yeah. That one works. So we typically don't have an issue meeting the 15% test because on, on these transactions, you're usually doing 20,000 a door or more in rehabilitation, which usually takes you in, in a well in excess of 15%. The 2% cost of issuance limitation is generally not a problem because you have private equity that's coming into the transaction, and so we will typically take your cost of issuance and allocate those to to your equity, and, and so you don't use bond proceeds for that. And then the the average maturity test, is, you can't, if, if a project has a 40-year useful life, the, the the period, the term on the bond has to have a rational relationship to to the life of the asset. So the IRS is saying, you know, we don't want you to, to finance something with a ridiculously long term when the asset won't last as long as the debt does. So that's that's really what they're looking for there. And then when you're looking at what you've already spent, so we understand that in all these transactions, you'll have some costs that you have to make at the outset before you've actually completed the. You, you close the, your financing, there are certain sub costs you have to make throughout the process. And so your bond proceeds are eligible to be used for reimbursement of some of those costs. Um, there, are, there are good costs that you can reimburse those. Um, two ways that you can do that. One is that you can get an inducement resolution, and in Oklahoma that is a requirement for all bond transactions that they are, are to be induced, which is that the issuer is saying that they are, they're not committing the financing, but they're saying that they're committing to potentially issue these bonds for this project and for this developer. And so any fees that you have paid or any costs that you have paid up to 60 days prior to that inducement date would be eligible to be reimbursed with bond proceeds. There's a second set of costs which are um, qualified pre-development expenses and there's a, there's a list of those and those would be like some architectural fees and um, environmental costs that you could reimburse with those um, bond proceeds that would also be eligible for that. So when you make those pre-development expenses, some of those can be covered by your bond proceeds. Um, and then for your arbitrage, this is Sujo's line, thank you. <laughs> well, He's very excited about it. Ar arbitrage is, a, is, is just a really big concept, and you can go to these national seminars, and they'll spend <coughs> actually two days on arbitrage. We, we will not. <laughs> we will not. We will just simply say that there are rules, which we call arbitrage, and says you can't borrow too much, too soon, or too long, or for a bad purpose. And I know that everybody here would follow those rules. Um, let me add one thing to what Alexander was saying about reimbursements. Usually, most of the costs that you actually pay out, so these are not costs that are incurred, it's the costs that are actually paid out. Most of these costs that you're going to pay out are pre-development in nature anyway. So you know, you're, you're going to be able to keep track of them, and later on, if there's a bond issue that's issued, you're going to be able to reimburse them. The one where you can get into a lot of trouble, the only one that we typically see where you can get into a lot of trouble is if you take down the land. So let's say that you have an opportunity to get a piece of property at a really good rate, and you decide to take it down. Now you're putting your bond deal together um, because you want to turn this into a bond transaction later. You really need to sort of get into OFA and get an inducement resolution done within 60 days of when you take down that land, when you pay for that land. Because if you don't do that, then you're not going to be able to include that land um, in your, well, you're not going to be able to reimburse uh, your, your, whatever you paid out for that land from the bond proceeds. And, and it, it's not necessarily land. It, it could be the building. If you want to take down the building, you can do that with, um, with the reimbursement resolution in place. You know, the little expenditure items, those, those are workable. Even if we get to a point where we're at closing and you've got we're looking at your reimbursements, and some of them are just not eligible for reimbursement from bonds. We can work around that. If you've got subordinate debt financing, we can use that to pay those costs. You can use equity. But for something as large as the property itself or the building, there's no way to structure around that. It's a big enough number that you have to make sure that it's an eligible reimbursement. <coughs> so th these are some of the rules that I was talking about, the quid pro quo, um, when you um, when you issue bonds, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, keeping up with this. There we go. Um, and, and those really, what we just talked about, really related to the use of the bond proceeds. 
These rules right now that I'm going to go through really quickly are basically other rules to get you to the tax exempt stage. Um, you need an allocation of bond, of bond cap. Um, did I go too far? I did. I apologize. Okay. Um, one of them is one of, one of the rules that you're going to have to abide by, and I'm sure you guys all understand this because you're here for affordable housing, is that um, you have occupancy rules. Um, you have to provide residential housing, residential rental housing. So it can't be transient in nature. You know, we're not financing hotels, motels, dormitories, things like that. And each unit has to have separate, complete living facilities for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation. Now, over the years, we've really had to sort of play around with what that means. Um, and the reason is, is because, you know, people want to sort of expand these rules as far as they can. For example, sometimes you want to do a transaction that's affordable, but it's an assisted living facility. And under state law, assisted living facilities perhaps can't have burners. Um, so we're able to sort of work within, within these rules and the guidance that the IRS gives us. So basically the rule is, is that if, you know, basically short of, of, of continual medical sort of uh, care, we can, we can probably find a way to do your transaction as a tax exempt housing transaction. We may have to sort of get you to modify what you're thinking of in terms of what the unit looks like, in terms of what size the unit is, in terms of what amenities the unit has in it. But basically, we can probably get you there. And, and as you guys probably know, one of the biggest challenges facing us uh, now and in the future is going to be elderly and assisted living housing for. And, and, and unfortunately, the, the area that's going to be impacted the most is, is in the area of affordable housing. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, and this is, we do have some relief there in terms of getting this stuff done. The, <clears throat> under, the, under the rules applicable to tax exempt bonds, when we talk about um, these occupancy, you have to make an election at the time you issue the bonds where you are either electing to um, set aside 20% of your units for people at or below 50% of AMI, or you are electing to set aside 40% of your units for people at or below 60% of AMI. That, those are the bond rules. Now, when you're doing these bond transactions, as Daryl was saying, a lot of times you're, you're doing this because you want also that 4% equity. The 4% equity also has similar rules relating to units, and, and they go a little bit further and give rental restrictions. But the reason why um, I'm bringing this up at this point is that usually, well, you want to maximize the amount of equity you're getting when you do a 4% deal. And basically what that means is that every unit that is affordable, you can get local housing tax credits for. So by, by and large, the vast majority of these projects that we see um, are, that are 4% deals are 100% affordable because they're, they're trying to maximize the amount of local housing tax credits that they get. Um, you still have to make the 2050 or 4060 election, but chances are if you're getting 4% credits, unless you really need to do a mixed income type facility, and we'll talk about that later because I know folks are interested in that. Unless that's your goal, um, you're trying to maximize your units, and so if you're maximizing your units, you're going to flow through these, uh, these requirements anyway. Um, these rules, this 2050 and 4060, they are not impacted by the new income averaging rule changes. Those of you that work in the, the, the work you play in the uh, tax credit space, there's some income averaging rules um, that service is now permitting that really sort of helps in terms of um, in terms of your local housing tax credit side. It's not impacted on the bond side. Um, it doesn't matter. It's not really gonna it's not really gonna uh, uh, provide a disadvantage to you anyway because you're going to be meeting these 20, 50, 40, 60 rules anyway. But I just wanted to throw that out there in case anybody's been doing these and, and they're curious about um, about uh, about that aspect of it. Sujo, you mentioned frat houses. That's sorority houses as well. <laughs> <laughs> also prohibited. Yeah, I've got to, got to update my sheet. <laughs> sorority houses are also prohibited, just in case anybody wanted to know. Just want to be clear. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you did? Well, thank you. Um, you, could, you could be the keeper of the... The clicker. Um, there are some other uh, requirements that are applicable to multifamily housing. I'm going to go through these quickly because generally it's kind of what, what this group up here will take care of. 
you need private activity volume cap. So remember I said that the 9% that is limited, but 4% is not directly limited, which is true. But again, in order to get 4% credits, you need tax exempt bonds. There is a limit on how much tax exempt bonds, I mean, the, the amount of tax exempt bonds can be issued by a state. And it's based on the state's uh, per capita um, um, uh, population. So private activity bond cap is what we refer to. That's, the, that's what limits the conduit bonds. The governmental bonds typically don't have a limit at all. You can issue as many of those as you want. Um, in, in Oklahoma right now, you don't have to worry about private activity volume cap because Oklahoma Housing has, um, uh, a lot. To, they have a lot, <laughs> and to our benefit, they've carried it forward. So you don't have to go to a separate state agency like you might have had to otherwise to apply for volume cap. You can all do it in-house, and trust me, that's, it, it not only gives you certainty, but it makes the process a lot easier. Um, we do have to publish some public notices um, in the area within which the facility is being built. Um, and then we have to uh, get the issuer's board, um, Daryl's board, to approve the, the transaction. Um, you will, to start this off, with, at the end Daryl will talk about this, but to start all of this off, you have to submit an application to OCO. And so when, as a process goes, as you go through the process uh, of submitting that application, you get board approvals at various places. <coughs> You then need some public approvals, um, and you publish a notice, and then ultimately we have to get the governor's approval. At the Oklahoma Housing Finance Agency, when you come to the board for approval, um, you are required to get both an inducement resolution approval and then a final approval, and you are not permitted to do that at the same meeting. So if you're trying to come and do a transaction very quickly, you need to note that the inducement resolution needs to be at one board meeting, and the approving resolution needs to be at a subsequent board meeting, and their board meets bi-monthly, so every other month. So. Um, when you're looking at your financing timeline, you should keep that in mind as to when you're targeting that inducement and when you're targeting that final approval. It's odd, odd months. Uh, typical participants to a bond issue are listed there for you. Uh, by the way, to give you a sense of the, the scope, uh, Oklahoma HFA has done about 180 million of these over the last several years in of these bond issues, 16 transactions total with Daryl, that correct? 16, 16 issues totaling. <coughs> Yeah, 16 or 17, mm -hmm. 180, 200. So, so you know. done, done plenty. This isn't the first thing. So we're, we're here to tell you about this because it works, and we've done plenty. Uh, and our firm has done over a billion of this over the, over that same time period with various state issuers around the country: Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, California, etc. The typical participants are listed there for you on this slide as well. And as Daryl mentioned, you've got a handout that has all these slides, place to take notes, and all of our contact information. So please, please use that to get in touch with us. Uh, the borrower owner is, of course, uh, you, the, devel the developer of the project, uh, issuer, of course, of the bonds, the actual obligor on this debt, it's Oklahoma HFA. Uh, bond underwriter is our firm of uh, Raymond James for Oklahoma HFA. Uh, bond counsel, of course, Dinsmore, Sujo's uh, firm. And the trustee, uh, in this case, is Bank of Oklahoma, Carries Group, who is basically a paying agent. I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the, uh, some of the main participants in these bond transactions. And the documentation basics on the next slide, uh, the, or the main, main ones are the loan agreement between the borrower developer and Oklahoma HFA, and then the bond purchase agreement between Oklahoma HFA and the underwriter, Raymond James, and, or if you if we have another underwriter in the transaction as well. The underwriter, of course, sells those bonds directly to the bondholders. The uh, issuer and the trustee enter, enter into an indenture uh, where, whereby the uh, payments on the bonds are made. We didn't want to get bogged down in this section too much. Um, so uh, Mark just briefly went over the participants and the documents, but they're in the appendices in case you need some nighttime reading. <laughs> and so at this, at this point, we've talked about the parties, we've talked about the documents, and we've talked about kind of the basic bond rules that you have to follow that you know the, the working group and the and bond council will really help you manage that process. So the next few slides are going to talk about, all right, what does a bond actually look like in the market? So when you're a developer, you, you decided you wanted to do an affordable uh, project, what does that actually look like? So we're not going to go through all the detail here, because it's quite a bit, so hopefully you can read it on your handout. Um, but I'll give you kind of the basics. There's multiple outlets for a developer when they're wanting to do a deal. The main keys are, what are, what are your goals as a developer? Is it leverage? Is it uh, the term or maturity of that debt that you're issuing? 
Is it the amortization? Uh, do you want the longer AM so you have a lower uh, cash flow uh, to service that debt over time? Or is it timeline? Are you, is your seller, if you're buying a project from a seller, is the seller giving you a very short timeline to actually purchase the property, issue your bonds so that you take control? Because oftentimes some sellers will give you 90 to 120 days, some won't give you that long, uh, or they'll put really stiff fees if you start missing timelines. So each one of these different options, uh, there's various pros and cons of each option. So I'll just hit on kind of the, the top few that we see often and we'll go a little bit more detail later. So there's a Fannie M type structure. This is a relatively new structure that's uh, kind of taking off on the market based on uh, the yield curves right now. Um, there's the Freddie Mac tax exempt loan structure. You'll also often hear that just called a Freddie Mac tell. Um, you'll see HUD 221D4s, HUD 223Fs, and then uh, this is my slide, so it's my fault. We say publicly offered at the top, but OFA has done so many, we, all, we actually added another uh, column called direct placements. Uh, those are not publicly offered, typically not rated. So like I said, there's pros and cons of each one of these. Uh, the HUD deals, uh, we have a slide later that goes into a little bit more. These are often short-term deals. So they have, you'll actually look at the loan side of it, it's usually the longest amortization and the longest term, but the bond that's tied to that, as uh, I think Sujo was talking about earlier, the bond's only outstanding until you're placed in service date. So your bond debt service is actually relatively low, but your loan term is often the lowest interest rate, longest AM, uh, longest term, however, longest timeline to actually get that deal done. Uh, and I'm- because, we, because you're dealing with HUD. Yeah, because you're dealing with HUD. Um, and <laughs> the government shutdown, for instance, uh, we know quite a few transactions that were in the works ready to close, and obviously they couldn't get a firm commitment or a closing date, and so, you know, there's headaches there. First dealing with Fannie Freddie or the current placements, which can often be, uh, often be a lot shorter. One thing to note on here, we do talk about like minimum sizes. I would say on most of these, there's not really minimum size. It's all just about efficiency. Uh, we've done kind of these short-term cash collateralized deals. We'll talk about a little later. We've done those as small as about three million in bonds, which means it was about a six, seven million dollar total development cost. So you can get relatively small, but you have to start weighing the value of the equity you're getting in the deal to the cost of actually issuing the bond deal. Um, so, even when you have small projects, I would say, most of us would say, reach out and we'll see if we can make it work. It doesn't always work, um, but it's, it's still worthwhile to look at. So you don't have to be a developer who's trying to do a $50 million bond deal. We would love that, um, but we're happy to do the small ones as well. And we've done all of these for OPA. OPA has done all of these transactions with respect, with exception of the Fannie Mae MTIP, but all these others have all been, uh, they're not theoretical, they've all been done for, for projects for uh, developers. Um, let me add one thing that, um, as, Tim's going to go through the, what these particular, um, each of these types of transactions, what they entail. But we've actually had, um, we've actually had developers come to us and say, hey, uh, I've got a bond deal lined up, um, and so I want to do a bond deal, can you produce the documents? And so the first question is, well, okay, well, what, do you have a term sheet? And what, what, you know, we, in order to create the documents, we've got to know what the underlying transaction is, and, they, and essentially they don't have a term sheet, but they had heard that bonds are a good way to finance projects. Well, they can be, but what we, you know, if you study this chart, really what, what, what helps us, what helps Tim, what helps Mark, me, Lewis, Alexander, and Daryl, is if, if you basically have some of these things in mind before you come to us, you know, what's, what's important to you, what's, what's going to fit your structure, what's going to fit your PSA. Um, and so spending time looking at this in terms of trying to figure out where you are will really help because these are the questions that, that we're going to ask when you come to us and say, hey, I'd like to do, try a bond transaction. Yeah, and like I, like I said, you know, the key facts are leverage, term, amor amortization, timeline. So if timeline is your biggest key, we strike out a couple of these pretty much right off the bat. And it helps yeah. us kind of organize our thoughts and direct you in the, in the, in the right way. And one thing that's unique that predated uh, my working career, but um, one reason some of these deals, have, some of these bond deals have come, come in vogue is uh, just the yield curves. Tax exemption, even as rates, we, we hear in the market tax exemption, or, uh, rates have started to increase, they're still at relatively <coughs> historic lows compared to, you know, a decade or so ago. Um, over, over 10 years ago, you would come to an underwriter, you know, Mark or I or Raymond James or another underwriter, and we would issue 30-year tax exempt bonds in the market with some form of credit enhancement or maybe no credit enhancement. Right now, you often need credit enhancement uh, of one of these styles, but you know, market dynamics change what you actually need. Um, so I would say, you know, 
as a developer, if you're new or if, if you've done a few deals, you may have a certain kind of transaction you really like, but I would say study all of them because as the market rates move around, any one of these can be the kind of the best game in town for one of your transactions. It doesn't mean HUD is always the best deal for <coughs> for every uh, development that you might be doing, or Freddie Tell or Fannie Mae. Although most of the deals we've done so far for those, those 16, 17 have been 220 HUD, 221 D4 with the short-term tax exempt uh, bonds just to get the tax credits for number two, the direct private placement with a, a bank. You know, the bank is lending you money, but they're going to do it in the form of a tax exempt bond loan. And so we'll, we'll go through these next slides pretty quick because they're just, it's putting words to kind of the prior slide. So when you're, can I, can I have to say, just to step back, uh, Tim's using the word credit enhancement. So, um, you know, when you go, when you go to the bank to borrow, to borrow money, the bank is going to ask you what's your collateral. And the better your collateral, the better terms you're going to get from the bank, whether it's interest rate or length or maybe even the size of the loan. So when Tim is talking about credit enhancement, the same thing works with bonds. If you have a facility and we just go out and issue bonds, and the only thing backing those bonds is a mortgage, that's, you know, in, in most instances, that's going to be a pretty risky um, uh, investment vehicle for whoever's buying those bonds. So what do you do? You add on collateral. Maybe there's a guarantee. Uh, maybe you find some other thing that makes the bond less risky. And that other thing is what, what Tim's talking about when he says credit enhancement. Usually it's a third party that's coming in saying, hey, I'm gonna guarantee or I'm going to assure the payment on your bond, so all of a sudden it becomes less risky. When that happens, then by and large in our world, that means you pay a lower interest rate um, as opposed to something that doesn't have credit enhancement. Yeah, so this side is just a various sources that are potentially out there. Uh, as I said, the majority of the deals we've done with OPA so far, that's just based on how the market is working right now, have been uh, FHA, RD, mortgage insurance. Uh, you got uh, letter, of, letter of credit structures that are out there. Sujo, we were talking earlier at lunch, and Sujo said he's seen more letter, letter of credit type transactions coming in on assisted living deals. Um, so that could be a structure that comes back in vogue. Uh, bond insurance. We don't see as much bond insurance, I think, on, on housing as you do on some other deals. But once again, market moves around, this can come back. And then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been creating newer products the last few years, so they've really come back in the market strong since the uh, since the crisis. Uh, and once again, we're focusing a little bit more on this page on publicly offered deals. And the reason you need that credit enhancement is if you're trying to sell uh, a rated bond, you're typically going to need the bond to be rated by S&P or Moody's in an investment category. Uh, and to do that, you'll need one of these credit enhancements to get the lowest rate uh, possible for your deal. But once again, if lowest rate's not your goal, you, you have plenty of cash flow on, you, on your deal for that particular situation, maybe you don't need the credit enhancement, and we could sell a non-rated bond. Um, so there's just various ways. Uh, and like I said, this is the 221D4, 223F, you know, FHA, um, you know, through HUD, these programs essentially it's insure third-party lenders against mortgage defaults. So you would work with a lender um, they would come up with the best uh, HUD or FHA product that would work. And, and importantly, the developer needs a uh, <coughs> needs a lender for that part of it, which they would get yeah. outside of it. But, but you'll have a, you all need some reference, some referrals on that. We're happy to do that. But uh, for the for these HUD products portion, you need the uh, HUD lender to, to do that one, transaction for you. Okay. Um, just next slide. Um, all right, this chart, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not, um, but you can make larger versions available later. Mark was saying that what uh, the instrument that has been used the most in multifamily housing in the last five, six, seven years is what we call the cash collateral bond, other, other times we call it the 50% test bond. So, you know, um, when I, when I first started this, it used to be that you could issue bonds and the proceeds of that bonds would be enough to, to, to build your facility, to pay the cost and to build your facility. Um, and the interest rate on those bonds, and, and, and the reason for that is because the interest rate on those bonds was, was very low um, for, as a price of tax type of instrument. Local housing tax credits came in, and so you've got this source of equity that comes in. And of course, that's great. It's not, you know, we call it free money, but we recognize it's not free because tethered with those tax credits come your limited partnership, partnerships that are, that are coming into the transaction. 
But in essence, it's you know it's, it's additional equity coming into the deal, which means you have to borrow less. Um, when the, when we had the market meltdown of, and, and I know that investment bankers don't don't like me to say market meltdown or the market wasn't working. There was something the market work, was working perfectly. It just it just wasn't working at what you needed it to be. But when that happens, you know that's an interesting distinction. <laughs> that, 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 that's what more than one investment banker has said. The markets worked perfectly. It just didn't work in your favor. <laughs> so what happened at that time is that historically tax exempt borrowing rates were far below commercial borrowing rates. So if you could get a 10% loan at a bank, you could get your transaction financed at maybe 6%, maybe 5%. Um, and that's obviously a huge impact. Well, when we had this market event that occurred, um, you heard Tim talk about a yield curve. The yield curve inverted, and all of a sudden, tax exempt borrowing rates were more expensive than commercial borrowing rates which kind of blows your mind because these are tax exempt. And there's, these guys could probably spend a day getting into all of that, but that was the reality that we were with. And so what ended up happening is bonds dried up. I mean, literally, nobody was issuing bonds. And instead, what, they were, what the developers were doing, I mean, they were still doing affordable deals, but the way that they were doing it is they were just going down and borrowing from a bank and getting an FHA insured loan because that was cheaper than doing a bond deal. They were leaving all this equity on the table. Because you can't go down to the bank, borrow money, get an FHA insured loan, and get tax credit equity. So I don't, has anybody here been involved with Hope 6 transactions? Hope 6 transactions were basically a, it was, a, it was another program that by and large was designed uh, in later years to, to help uh, large cities deal with the huge Section 8 projects they had built. At one point, the world thought, oh, the best thing to do is to put up a 600-unit tower and fill it with only Section 8 tenants. And I'm not exactly sure why they thought that would be a good idea, but that was, that was what was going on. Well, those, pro those, those facilities, you, you know, well, call, call them projects at the time, those, those projects needed to be redone, and so they came up with the SOAP 6 program. The problem is that they were large. I mean, if you wanted to issue bonds to do these, to, to take these projects and to rehab them and turning, turn them into something that works in modern society, I mean, we're talking about two, three hundred million dollar bond transactions. So on that Hope Six side, what they and, and, and you know the, the states didn't have that much of a volume cap to give you for for a bond transaction that size. So there were different ways that we dealt with it. One way that we dealt with it, Hope Six was actual money that came into the deal, so you didn't actually need to issue bonds. What you did is you leveraged it. So we, we, what the state housing finance agencies did is they said, well, look, we'll give you some 9% money. We'll give you an allocation of 9% money, because all of them wanted the 9% because they didn't need bonds. But in, in return, you have, to, you have to issue some uh, bonds, bond cap, and, and get 4% tax credits. And, <coughs> but they didn't need long-term debt, because again, they had this Hope 6 money that was coming in during and after construction uh, so there was not going to be any debt on the project. Um, and so basically we dusted off a program that they used uh, and we, we sort of polished it up some in 2007-2008 and that's what we call our cash collateral or 50% test bond. Um, we went to the developers and we said, you, you guys are out there you know, pricing HUD, HUD loans and um, you're leaving this 4% tax credit money on the table. What if we could get you your 4% tax credit money, and in return, all you had to do was pay a little bit of additional interest during the construction period. And they said, well, the numbers work, that would be good. So what the cash collateral bond is, is you find a lender that's going to issue a HUD-insured mortgage loan. At the same time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna issue bonds that'll be just enough to be able to get you your tax credits with the cushion that Lewis mentioned, the, 40 to, the, the, the 55 to 60 percent cushion. Um, ultimately, what this chart is showing is, at the end of the day, after you place your project in, in service, the bonds go away. What's being used to pay off the bonds? It's the, it's the HUD loan that, that you receive from the lender. So basically what we're doing is, we're taking the HUD loans, we're taking the HUD loan proceeds, and we're washing it through our indenture, and we're building your project, at the end of the day, the money that remains in the indenture is, is used to pay off the bonds. 
During that period of time, those bonds are outstanding. They're collateralized with the best collateral you can have, which is cash. And I know it sounds gimmicky what I'm talking about, but we've done literally billions of dollars of these deals, and I can explain it in, in greater detail later. But this is the, this chart right here represents the 50% test um, transaction. You issue your bonds, you put them in the indenture, and you put it into your project fund. Simultaneously, at the bottom right here, you get your lender to issue an FHA insured mortgage loan, and those monies go into the escrow account. Each dollar that gets into the escrow account stays there, but it has the effect of releasing a dollar from the project fund, which is used to build the facilities. As you go through your construction, your project fund gets lower, and your escrow fund gets higher, and at all times, there's enough money in there to pay off your bonds. When you place your project in service, because as Lewis said, in order to get the tax credits, it has to be part of your permanent, the bonds have to be part of your permanent financing. Well, that's, permanent financing is defined as a day into your, into your, you know, day after your place and service date. So you get your place and service date, the bonds go away, all you're left with is now what's down in the bottom right hand corner, which is your loan, your HUD loan with your lender, and that's, you know, what you're going to continue to pay on. So there's a lot in this chart, but this is what has really worked. The good news is the bond markets are coming back, and we're seeing other structures that we've used before come back, but this is still by and large among the best ways to finance a 4% uh, housing transaction in, in today's markets. Yeah, that's a good point, Sujo. This structure you just described, this cash collateralized, is the most common structure that we've used, and usually with 221D4 FHA loans for, uh, for OPA over the last several years. And as I said, it sounds a little gimmicky, and keep in mind, these bonds are not actually financing your project. They're being issued and you're only going through this process, only do, only doing this, incurring this additional marginal additional time to do it and work, and and some additional cost to get the equity contribution. So that's the that's the analysis. We have a show of hands, by the way, which of the, uh, the developers or which folks in the room have done uh, nine percent deals. Yeah, not yeah, nine percent. Yeah. How about four percent with with bond? Okay. This, this um, page 21 of this current slide is a sample of sources and uses of funds. And I'll just, and, and this is was from a real transaction and basically 23 and a half million of, of project costs. The main funding for this project being, of course, this HUD 224, 221D4 loan, as we said. And I'll just draw your attention to the, uh, the what, what it got. Why, why did this developer go to the, this trouble of issuing bonds? And the answer is to get this tax ec credit equity investor contribution of 13.7 13, uh, $13 million. So it was about 25 to 30% of his total project costs. So uh, we won't, won't go to all, all the details there, but that gives you a basic source of uses and why the, why the investor was interested in that. And the answer was to get additional 25 to 30% equity on this transaction. And, and you know, as we said earlier, you're incurring the cost of issuing the bonds, and you're weighing that against the equity that you're getting um, to go through the to go through the process. The other thing that uh, to keep in mind is we're talking about you're getting a, a loan from a lender, and you're issuing bonds. Oftentimes, you're you're marrying the issuance process of working with OFA and working with Bond Council, working with us and the other professionals. You're marrying that up with your process as you're working through getting your loan. So oftentimes, it's not adding additional time. Uh, you know, HUD can take a very long time, but once you get further along in the HUD process, for instance, that's when you really can start getting bond council and others engaged on the bond side so that we marry it up with your HUD timeline. So I wouldn't look at a bond process as additional time. Um, it's the expense of issuing the bonds, weighing that first getting the equity. Right. Um, this side, we wanted to throw this in here uh, because we've actually done quite a few of these in, o uh, in Oklahoma and elsewhere. Um, so USD. USDA loans and RD loans also work in that cash collateralized uh, type structure. Obviously, you're doing those in the more limited population areas, uh, being USDA, uh, RD. The benefit of those is, um, I think mostly what we've been talking here, and probably most of what you guys are thinking about, is you're talking about trying to finance one facility, one project, one building, or multiple buildings, but you know all next to each other. Oftentimes on the USDA, RD, you're able to pool essentially 10, 15, 20, scattered site properties and do one financing. So you get really efficiency by doing that. So if you tried to finance each one of those uh, properties on a, on a bond transaction, that wouldn't happen. Um, 
concerns. And there's just simply not enough 9% credit to handle the entire volume of units of RD property throughout the state. And that's just the case everywhere. And so, so what states have been doing is looking at ways to, to do pools of RD projects with the 4%, and uh, I know Oklahoma's been successful in that. The other thing is that with your, your USDA deals, the 515 program, that, you know, all these deals typically have $515 old USDA money in the project that can get assigned to the new buyer, re advertise, and then the NPR program to the extent that it's funded and, and one or two or three of the projects in an RD portfolio can get an NPR award, some new 515 money in the transaction that, that substantially helps these projects work. I'm sorry, can you repeat that and speaking to the mic? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry Thank about you. that. To the oh, that's much better, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was turned off before. <laughs> the, the USDA transactions, uh, and this is going to sound repetitive to the people in the front, but there just isn't enough 9% credit in any state to, to rehab all of the existing USDA units that are out there. And there's just not enough to go around when you consider the, the new construction of the other activities that, that are also priorities in the state. And so what developers have done successfully in Oklahoma and in other states is pool the RD projects into one portfolio and start to do these deals. And what I was mentioning is that to the extent that you can uh, obtain an NPR loan for one or multiple projects within the portfolio, that's a difference maker in terms of making these portfolio work. Uh, and the NPR is effectively new 515 money that comes into the deal. The old 515 money stays, it gets re-amortized and assigned to the, to the purchasers, so to speak. But uh, by and large, that's, that's the strategy here and that's what, what I've seen be successful in Oklahoma and elsewhere. Yeah, including scattered sites. Yes. Those little kids, so so. Uh, not really going to touch on this one too much because we talk, kind of talked about it. It's just another credit source. Uh, so, do you have anything on the or anything like that? Um, all I'll say is that we have seen uh, letters of credit come back. Um, in the old days, uh, you would use letters of credit to, to credit enhance long-term bond deals, and you would want a variable rate bond. So, basically, you had a letter of credit, you had a liquidity facility. And um, those became way more expensive than, um, um, th they just became very expensive as the, the market sort of uh, adjustment occurred. Um, so we haven't really seen letters of credit um, uh, in recent years. I, I am starting to see them come back, and I don't know why they're for assisted living deals. Maybe it's just, you know, we all work in a certain sphere, and once we hear what our the people that are in our sphere are doing, we, we also do the same thing. So, but it just seems to me that I've been seeing more uh, assisted living deals do letter of credit deals without the liquidity component. So they're still fixed, they're fixed rate, they're not floating rate, right? um, but they have a letter of credit that backs the bonds. And just this week, um, we were contacted by a local bank who is going to get a federal home loan bank wrap on their letter of credit and therefore raise the credit enhancement rate. So, just, I guess just keep an eye out. Um, these things are seem to be coming back. Um, I don't know to what extent they will. And uh, so this picture is a little different looking than uh, the prior one where we were talking about the FHA cash collateralized. However, it's very similar. It was to get it on the page with the other text. Um, essentially, on the Fannie Mae MTEB, that's a longer term bond issuance. On the FHA side, remember the loan was long term, but the bond issuance was only for like a two to three year period. Uh, one difference on the Fannie Mae MTEB is it's actually a longer term bond issue. It's 30, 35 year amortization with a 17 year uh, put. Uh, in this case, obviously you work with your underwriter and OFA, you sell bonds. The bond proceeds goes into the trust estate, the project fund. Uh, the borrower makes draws through their construction lender. Those proceeds go into the collateral fund or escrow fund as we said on the other slide. One bucket goes down as the other one goes up. Uh, what's unique on the Fannie Mae MTEB side, so this would be on a forward basis where you had a construction period. Uh, what's unique here is once the project fund proceeds have been spent on the project and you're essentially been through your placed in service, uh, you've got to your placed in service date, 100% of your proceeds are now sitting in the collateral fund. So you've been cash collateralized in some form of eligible funds. Those funds now purchase a Fannie Mae MBS, and now that is the collateral uh, for the bondholder. So it kind of marries, well, on a forward basis when you have a construction period, it marries the cash collateralized structure with a longer term bond financing. And it's kind of, it's a 
it's a market play, right? There's different guarantees, there are different uh, uh, bond components, or there are different components to getting an FHA loan or Fannie Mae or Freddie Tell, uh, but what that does is it's kind of marrying the the efficiency of that cash collateralized piece with a longer term bond financing based on yield curves, et cetera. Based on service date, you purchased the Fannie Mae MBS, that's now the collateral for the bond investor. Uh, and that's why those structures get a high uh, AAA rating from rating agencies and are easier to sell into the market because they're highly weighted, high, uh, Fannie Mae MBS, very liquid. Um, and an attractive borrowing rate, attractive. Yeah, it's, it's an attractive rate for the borrower as well. Question. Is your rates locked in on this style of transaction? Is it yes. Uh, yeah. So the, on the FHA loans uh, and on so the bond tied to the FHA loans and the bond tied to a Fannie Mae MTEBS uh, loan, those rates are fixed. We're gonna go through. So, so the next is the spreading tell program. So I'm not gonna really spend a lot of time on this. What what we're talking about right now is we're seeing long term bond issues come back. And so that's what, Fann, what the, the Fannie Mae. Uh, MTEP structure that um, Tim just talked about, that's a long-term bond issue. Similarly, Freddie Mac has a similar um, um, uh, a similar uh, structure where it's a long-term bond issue. Um, the reason I'm not going to go in, I mean, th this is all very confusing, but basically it's just a long-term bond issue, and literally what they did is they, they, they picked up a set of bond documents that we've used for many years, and they global bond to governmental notes and they global trust indenture to project loan agreement, or funding loan agreement, thank you. And they global the issuer to governmental issuer. But the bottom line is that Freddie Mac has a product just like the product that Fannie Mae has, where it's a long-term bond issue, and basically you can enter into forward commitments for these deals as well, so that it's fixed out after construction. And one of the benefits of these Fannie Mae programs and the Freddie Mac programs is that they are faster. They're significantly faster than going through a HUD program, um, either the 223F or, or the 221D4. Um, so if your timeline is really tight, these products can be very beneficial for them. Or if we have another governmental shutdown. That's right. Even though construction you, you do. There, there typically is a construction lender because um, they don't want to take construction risk. But you know that construction lender. I mean, it's part of a single package. So they're gonna they're gonna do all the underwriting even for the long term loan. I mean, yes, when you go to convert, you're gonna have to meet your underwriting criteria to see how much of that construction loan converts to firm. But you're gonna know those numbers going in, right? Is Freddie just guaranteeing a bond, or is Freddie taking the bond down like a loan? <coughs> In the Freddie Tell program, they're actually going to purchase the loan into their portfolio. So it's similar to a private place. Yeah, yeah. And if we get into big up in yourself. Well, their, their program, Freddie Tell's program is a little bit different than the Fannie Mae program, but yeah, it'll, it'll pick up the construction <coughs> and then it'll go into what'll happen is you get a. Both of those programs work together with a. Would <laughs> 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 you mind holding this for me? <laughs> He's giving me that. Side eye. So both both of these programs work with a construction lender, but the construction lender in both of these programs, and it can be anybody. We've done it with Key, we've done it with um, Bellwether, we've done. I mean, there's just a lot of different lenders that we've okay. Red Capital. We've done it with a lot of different lenders. So so they're they're embedded. Each of them can do it. They're embedded in this particular transaction. So they're in as the construction lender. <coughs> And they enter into a commitment, a forward commitment with either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac to purchase the instrument upon conversion. And as long as you underwrite, then you know what your converted amount is going to be. You're not going to have any you know, true ups or true downs. Um, so, but yeah, both programs work hand in hand. So you, you don't have to go out and find separate construction. <coughs> well, I was going to add that even though uh, both Freddie and Fannie are owned by the federal government. They don't shut down during the federal government. So with their federal government shutdown, so they've actually been working in January, uh, which has given us something to do because all the HUD and FHA deals um, basically went pencils down for what maybe 45 days. Yeah, and you talked to the one banker who said, "Send me all your HUD deals." So if the if the shutdown would have gone longer, we probably would have. Yeah, and, and Lance, we have done the Freddie Mac tail structure twice in the, both in the new page and also more, more recently just last month in a more transaction of one, right. more of the transaction. So the Freddie Mac is also something we, we've done recently for OPA. Pretty smooth. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you're not asking for waivers, the rules are all right there. Um, and that's why, I'm sorry. If you're not asking for waivers, the rules are all laid out for you. There's a certainty in the process. Um, there, there really aren't any surprises. Where it gets bogged down is, like every transaction, you'll, you'll find a work here and there and you've got to deal with it. And whether you can deal with it without asking for a waiver from one of Fannie or Freddie's provisions is really the difference between you know, on your time frame. But yeah, they're, they're pretty smooth. And this is a good transition to private placements. We talked about publicly selling the bonds. Uh, the Freddie and the Fannie Mac, the Freddie and the Fannie are essentially private placements. As well, yeah, the, 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 Fred, the Freddie Mac is essentially a private placement. But when we talk of private placements, we're really more thinking of a, a bank private placement. That we're, instead of publicly selling these bonds, they're privately placed with a, with a financial institution. And the borrower owner is actually borrowing money from, from that banker lender and OPA is involved because the tax exempt give so the borrower is now getting tax exempt income on his loan for uh, number one. And number two, it allows the four percent tax credits in the transaction. Yeah, commercial banks are are our normal buyers for that. Uh, benefits generally a little quicker time as as Lewis mentioned, you know, all pencils were down during the uh, federal the shutdown and, and HUD just takes longer anyway. Uh, bank private placements uh, you know, usually go quite a bit more quickly, particularly if you already have a good uh, relationship and track record with the, with the financial institution who's buying these bonds. And so it's really a question for the bank if they're willing to take it in a tax exempt uh, private placement fashion. And once again, as Tim mentioned, if, that, if the 4% uh, tax credits are worth it for you for the extra expense. And if I could add a tip in here. So to the extent that you've been doing affordable housing, and I'm, you're here, so I'm, I'm assuming you have, and if you've not been using uh, bonds and you're not doing the 9% program, that's basically what it means is you are getting a loan someplace from a bank. Often, if you want to dip your toe into these kinds of transactions and you have a good relationship with your bank, especially if you have a smaller size deal, um, a great way to do that is to go to your bank that would be making you a loan anyway and asking them if they have an appetite for tax exempt, for tax exempt loans. So, if they say yes, we can work together with them to turn their loan, their commercial taxable loan, into a tax exempt loan and thereby allowing you to access 4% credits. As long as they're not using laser pro to generate documents. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about additional equity, and on your slide, you know, the, the big equity that, that people are, are are usually hungry for is the nine percent credits. That that is frankly the richest form of a deal that you can do because there's just so much equity per transaction. We've talked quite a bit about four percent credits. Um, I do want to, sorry. I do uh, want to hand it over to Daryl to talk about the Oklahoma State tax credit because that's that's something new, that's something exciting. For historic properties, you do have the ability to, to go to the National Park Service and get historic tax credits to, to support your project. There are other forms of uh, gap fillers that we can be creative or that you can be creative in, in establishing. Uh, the one that's frequently used is deferred developer fee. Frankly, the, the numbers don't work, and so you end up putting a little bit of developer fee back into the deal to, to make your sources and uses line up. Uh, Daryl's going to talk a little bit about state tax credits. Uh, we are seeing quite a bit of, of GP capital, and sometimes the GP capital can, can manifest itself from federal home loan bank money that's coming into the transaction where, where it's, it's being invested through the GP as opposed to a subordinate loan. But then, you know, some investors want your deferred developer fee to not go beyond 12 years. And so what happens is that you just, if you have a nonprofit in a deal, it's very easy to have the nonprofit's portion of the developer fee converted to GP capital so that you don't have to worry about uh, the IRS looking at your developer fee and, and it going out for more than 12 years because the nonprofit's already um, taking it. Uh, they're not taking a tax hit for the developer fee and then they're, they're inserting it as GP capital. Uh, an area that, that can help, particularly if, if you're looking at recycling your own portfolio, sometimes seller notes uh, are used to make the, the numbers balance. Uh, seller notes can also help us with, with some of the related party and bond pro the use of bond proceeds analysis. Uh, so that's, that's a strategy that's there that if, if we get to it, you know, you've come to us, we're trying to figure out how to make a deal work. 
sometimes the seller knows the, 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 the avenue of, of last resort, but it's something that we can do. And then obviously, most of you are going to be good at this, looking at agency money, whether it's home or other types of state dollars. Uh, local local municipalities sometimes have dollars that they'll use for, for affordable housing. Sometimes they're willing to put CDBG into affordable housing. So those those just vary from community to community based on the level of local commitment that there's to to affordable housing. So if I want to turn it over to Darrell, I'll talk about state credit. Okay, thank you, Lewis. Uh, one of the most common comments that I get from developers is, you know, these bonds and 4% tax credits are great, but, you know, I'm still left with about a 20% gap and I'm trying to figure out how to fill. And we talk about, you know, going to the Federal Home Loan Bank and, and getting AHP money and, and various other things uh, like Lewis was just talking about. One of the, one of the few gap fillers that we have uh, is the state tax credit. There is a state tax credit in Oklahoma. Uh, what we have is uh, we have dedicated at OHFA two million dollars of the four million that we have uh, to be used in conjunction with bond and four percent tax credit deals. Um, now there's some limitations to it. Uh, it's for new construction only. Uh, it cannot be used in Oklahoma, Cleveland, or Tulsa counties, uh, and it must equal the federal credit. So however much the federal credit is, the state tax credit has to equal it. Um, the other thing, the final thing is you do have to adhere uh, to the um, uh, tax credit application cycles, just like for 9% credits. Um, uh, if, uh, for this year, for 2019, we do not have any applications in the first round for state tax credits. So that means that that $2 million, that full $2 million will now be available for the second cycle. Um, so if you're interested in it, you would make application uh, by Thursday, June the 27th uh, at 5 p.m., just like you would if you were applying for 9% credits for the second round. So um, state tax credits um, are typically purchased by investors at lower cents on the dollar. Uh, than the other tax credits, but uh, that's something you'll just have to pencil in and figure out how much of that gap uh, it will fill. It's probably not going to fill all of the gap, but it will certainly help make it there. And Daryl, you recall we did a transaction that had all of those elements, had the 4% uh, tax credit, state tax credit, plus the store, all in one, one yeah. layer. In one and Mattel did. And Mattel did. <laughs> you're, you're, uh, Wait, can you hear what but we have done a tr <clears throat> transaction that had all, all three of those layers, the 4% tax credit, the state tax credit, and the historic tax credit. And it was a pretty Mactel deal, so all, and, all the all layers. And the, as you get into the state tax credit, you start to figure out how to, how to make that program work. I think you're gonna find that it's not very painful at all. Our experience, we, we've done these types of, of transactions with state credits in, in Georgia and a couple other states have very active programs. And it really, there's a, state, there's a particular buyer of state tax credits, and they're just another participant on the call. They end up being another a special limited partner in the transaction, and they're being allocated a tax credit within the state tax credit, within the partnership agreement. And they typically don't tinker around too much with your phone calls or with the partnership agreement. They're just in there to make sure that, that they're getting allocated the credit and that it lines up. So, it, it works really, really well because it's just a piggyback on an existing federal program. So from, from an efficiency standpoint, it just, it just works. Slide is more just kind of a summary of the credit, credit worthiness of the bond issue. So as we said earlier, there's a conduit bond. Uh, it can be publicly offered or privately placed. It's really a question of what rate do you want? If, it's, if you add credit enhancement to it, you'll be highly rated, you'll get a lower interest rate. If you want to go for private placement, you might be a slightly higher rate, but you can pick up some, uh, some time uh, benefits there. And from an underwriting standpoint, we can sell whatever you'd like to do. We, just, we have to educate the borrowers more when it's uh, less credit worthy or doesn't have a rating, et cetera. This, um, the ne this next part is a, is a timeline that we're going to go over, but I'm going to skip it because it's 4.15. I want to make sure that we have time for questions, but you can look at this. Uh, it's just it, it's a sample time frame from an actual transaction that we did. Um, and you know, we started it in November, and ultimately uh, the transaction closed in June. 
I would say that maybe a little bit longer than normal, but um, for this transaction, that's what it was. And when you look at the timeline, it has all of the requirements that you have to meet for OFA. So when you're looking at the requirements we went through before, you can see them on that timeline and where they would likely fall within your deal, whether the timeline's shorter or longer. And then the next slide is uh, we wanted to give you a sample uh, cost of issuance for issuing the bond. So what you're really doing is the cost for issuing the bonds. You're weighing it first the equity benefits that you're getting. So it is a sample $10 million deal. This pretty much has all the players on the bond side uh, listed. Um, there's other members not on the panel that are here for the trustee. They're here as well. Uh, FA to OFA uh, is here as well. So this pretty much is all of the bond related costs on it. Estimated to million dollar deal obviously it goes up and down based on bond sizing, etc. So you're weighing this first the benefits of picking up the equity in the deal. Which of the fees are negotiable? <laughs> Not ours. No. <laughs> everything, everything but Sue Joe. <laughs> everything well, is negotiable. Well, I would say a good majority of these are through RFP through OFA, so a good majority are fixed. However, the bond, the bond you choose is different, right? If you're doing a private placement, you're paying us a fee, but it's not the same fee as if it's a publicly offered deal because our role is different. So this is just a go by. I know uh, OPA also has a, a list of fees listed on their website. It's not all of these parties because not all of these parties are on every single deal. But it's a good go by just so you have an idea of what fees might be. Okay, so uh, a lot of information. Uh, if you're interested in applying, uh, it might be nice to know that um, it's kind of a one application process for both the 4% credits and the bonds. Um, if you go to our website and you look at the tax at our tax credit application, that is both the application for 9% credits and 4% credits. Uh, the only difference is that for the 4% credits, you don't have to pay attention to the section uh, selection criteria section where you're trying to get points as if you were trying to compete if you were applying for 9% credits. You just have to pass threshold. Okay. Um, and the best part about it is the application for the tax credits suffices for your application for the bonds. Um, so the beauty of all this is um, you get your bonds the same place you get your tax credits. It's one application. Uh, we try to make it as, as simple as possible. Um, we've, we've heard a lot of information this afternoon, a lot of it. Uh, might make you glaze over, uh, it gets a little complicated, uh, but suffice it to say that that's what these people up here are for. They're the professionals, they're the ones that put it together. So if you have a development that you're looking at doing and you think that this is a structure that might potentially work for you, come to us. Let us figure out whether it will or not. Let us help you, help you structure your deal. Okay, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great financing tool. It's not for everybody and it's not for every deal. Uh, but it certainly is an answer uh, to, a, uh, to this crisis that we find ourselves in in Oklahoma of not having enough affordable housing. We've done a great job in this state of creating jobs um, and uh, but we have a lot of people who can't find an affordable place to live, especially for rental housing. So uh, this is a great way to get these projects uh, financed, and uh, we encourage you to think about it. Uh, so uh, what I want to do at this point is open it up uh, for any questions uh, that you might have. And uh, speak loudly. Is there a, a timeline or time, a maximum time between inducement and closing? Yes. What is the requirement here? Is there a maximum timeline between inducement and closing? I think I'll put, you put it in the context of reimbursement. Yeah. So, so it's really the, 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 the notion is that how long is my inducement good for? So if I, I go out and I get an inducement tomorrow, you know, the, the main benefit to the inducement is that it's going to allow me to pick up reimbursement expenditures 60 days prior to the, to the inducement. Well, if, if it goes for too long, then, then that inducement is stale. Those expenditures aren't expenditures that I can, I can bring into the deal. I think it's 12 months. 
Yeah, something like that. The, the other thing is the TEFRA notices. Once we, we TEFRA the property and we get public notice now, that's very different than public hearings that you might have for zoning purposes. These are not meetings that, in my experience, are generally attended by the public. But you still have to have them because the code requires you to. Though that TEFRA hearing is generally good for a year. Once that's done, and, and after a year we have to recap the project. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think the other answer is a year. Get an inducement, it basically has to be closer than a year. Otherwise, you have to get reinduced. I know that. The bond, the state bond agency, their approval is only good for 180 days. Okay. Yeah. 180 days. So, yeah, their approval is good for 180 days. They have the option to extend it for another 180 days at the discretion of the state bond advisor. So you can have a full year with the with, once you get the CBO approval. Um, you just have to keep track of those timelines so that you can make those requests within a timely manner, and then you can go back to them. Yeah. But you know, by the time you go for COBO approval, your um, sorry, they don't like that uh, committee of bond oversight. By the time you go to the committee of bond oversight for uh, approval. You're, you're pretty well in your deal. I mean, it's it's a rare deal that you go even through a year. So um, that, that one it shouldn't be too much of a concern. The inducement, you know, um, I think Oklahoma Housing has the foresight to allow you to do an, an inducement without submitting a full application. So that, that one you might do the inducement earlier than you need. Um, I think what, what I would do is, is look to see the cost that you're gonna incur you are welcome to give us a call. We don't we don't bill by the hour, so we want to encourage folks to call us even early on. Even if your project doesn't go through, I mean, you're, you're getting some information. Maybe you'll do a bond deal in the future. But if you're starting to incur some costs, that's when you want to start thinking inducement. You give us a call. And we'll tell you whether they're pre-development or not, and we'll kind of guide you to when we think you should go in for an inducement. I'm not really sure there would be another reason to do an inducement. Um, I mean, I don't think that if if you're getting local funds, if they're agency funds or home funds, I don't usually think that they require an inducement at the time of application. If you have a, a local municipality that says, now we want to know your issuer is on board, then we can do it at that point. That, that 12 months after inducement, is that 12 months to allocation? It's not 12 months to close. It's, it's, um... Could you repeat the question? Uh, Lance asked if the 12 months relating to reimbursement um, is from the inducement or from the allocation? Well, no, he, he said you have 12 months after inducement to capture to, to what? 12 months to allocation? To, to, actually, to actually pay the expenditure. Oh, okay. So, for it to be a valid expenditure or reimbursement? Well, you have to pay it within that period of time in order for later on to go back and, and to reimburse that. There's some nuances to that rule. I mean, if, if you're looking, if you think, if you're paying those kind of monies that aren't pre-development, remember, you don't need an inducement for pre-development. So, so, really so really, I think that um, you're, you're looking at either the purchase of land or, as, as Lewis mentioned, you're, you're, you're taking down land and building. I, I, I just, I have a lot of respect for developers. There's just no developer I know that's going to put that kind of money in that early. Not even you, Lance. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe you. <laughs> Did we go over the minimum and maximum number of doors for development? I know we said three million minimum, but number of doors. Repeat the question. The question is, did we go over a minimum or maximum number of doors for development? And I don't know that we can sit here and give you a minimum or maximum. Necessarily, it, it, you know, there, there is a number that's too small where you just can't justify the cost of issuance. And yeah, Sujo says it's about a million and a quarter, so you know that that can you can look at that and think about what your doors are for that price. But you know, there's really not a maximum. And when you start thinking about a portfolio transaction where you might have 20 scattered site rural development projects. The, the numbers can be pretty big. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, we've done we've done multifamily housing deals as large as 150 million. Um, we've done a Tennessee deal that had 27 properties um, scattered around the state. So the, the maximum really is not going to be there, especially on a four percent deal. 
hopefully someday we'll get to a point where you're using up all the state's bond volume cap, and if you get to that point, then yeah, then you're going to have some maximums, but that's related to the bond issue. I think when you're thinking about a maximum, if you're a fully integrated development company, your maximum is going to be driven by what your construction company can tackle more so than what these programs can support. Because the program is built for scale, but your your bonding capacity and construction may not handle the scale that, that the program can. That, that's right. There are no minimum or maximum doors for OPA or for 4% uh, tax bond purposes. No, no rules on that. Any, any other questions? No. Yes, sir. Why are your major counties uh, ineligible for state tax credits? The, the question is, why are your major counties ineligible for tax credits? And I'm going to duck. <laughs> because that's the way the law is written. Actually, that is. That, he ducked too. <laughs> that, there is, there is, uh, there are some bills that have been introduced uh, in both the uh, House and the Senate for this next session that would um, uh, let us finance these, or, or issue these tax, state tax credits in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Cleveland counties. I don't know where that's gonna go, but the reason for it was the thought that this should be a rural program, and they thought that, uh, that the big cities of Tulsa and Oklahoma uh, City uh, probably had other sources of financing. The rural areas needed more help, so though, that's why they were excluded. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, will, will you kind of hit how this top financing fits in with market rate units once you've kind of met your low income set aside? Sure. So, so the question is is about doing mixed finance, or um, I shouldn't say mixed finance because that's that tends to be a high term. But how do, you, how do you mix use so that you have market rate and affordable uh, housing in, in one facility? And you know, when you're looking at the 9% transaction, th there's tremendous incentive to do 100% affordable because your tax credits are associated with the number of units that are affordable. And so if you do 100% affordable, then you can maximize your basis, maximize the equity. Um, that doesn't have to be the case with the bond program. And you don't have to use, and there are transactions where they say, you know, yes, the equity is free, but you know, it's, it's really free for 15 years because at the, you know, doing a tax credit deal is like getting married, knowing that you're gonna be divorced in 15 years. And so if you think about the partnership agreement as a prenuptial agreement, that, that's what it is. And so you, you, have to, you have to figure that out on the back end. And you're a developer and you're looking at it, like, I can do this part in years, I gotta fool around with this investor and get them out of the transaction. And depending on what their financial circumstance is, they may want a backdoor bite at my pocketbook. So I don't wanna fool around with them. I'd rather use the lower cost of bond financing and tap into some of these forms of credit enhancement to, to do my deal. And there, there really isn't a driver like there is with the tax credit transactions to do 100% affordable. You are incentivized in a 4% or 9% transaction to go 100% affordable because once you have the investor in there, you've inserted some degree of, of back end pain into your transaction. And so if they're in, then you get them in and you get as much as you can get from them. But if they're not in, realistically, on a bond, pure bond finance deal, you only have to hit the 2050 or 4060 rule. And then beyond that, you can go 100% market rate. Same thing is true if you wanted to do an assisted living transaction and, and you know we have to work on what the facility looks like, but if you want to do assisted living and do a share of the units affordable uh, assisted and another share market rate, it'd be very, very easy to do uh, using a bond program. It, it would just be the debt, the, the financing would be bonds. You would probably stay away from the credits. Uh, you don't have to but I've not seen an, an appetite for developers to use credits, but then only use them for, for part and not all, unless there's a local incentive to do it. Sometimes for planning and zoning, they say that, no, we want you to do, if you're a market rate developer, they'll tell the market rate developer, we'll let you do this 
this property in this area if you also do some affordable. And so, so sometimes localities can encourage that. Uh, but what what I think what I think works for us here is if we're looking at the bond program and we're not doing credits, there's a tremendous opportunity to do market rate housing with the bond program. And still get a favorable financing. Yes, yeah, sir. That, that's right. And Kurt, I guess of, of that 2050 or 4060 test, the developer always chooses the 4060, and that, that's the bare minimum. Yeah. What, 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 sorry. <laughs> well, one thing that I'll add. So, so just to recap, you, yes, if, if you have an, a, a, let's say a, a redevelopment area, and you're really looking at it long term with what's good for the community, often you're going to choose to want to have a good mix of affordable and market rate in that area. So yes, you can you can create bond finance even with four percent credits. And, and decide you're going to do 2050, so 20% 20 of units are set aside, or 40% of your units. The one, the one thing that I will tell you is that your commercial units, your market rate units in that transaction, can't look completely different from your market rate units. The other thing you cannot do, and it boggles my mind that this day and age, you know, I have to say this, but in New York, I think it was last year, it was mm -hmm. the year before, they did a they did a market rate, a, a market slash affordable unit, and they had a door set up for all the affordable tenants and another door set up for all the market oh. rate. You can't do that. <laughs> but the good news is, is that these days, a lot of affordable housing that's being built, I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, in Ohio, We've, got, we've had them with a Corian and with marble countertops, and the developer said, I'm spending that, well, maybe it was kind of grand, I can't remember what it was, but they said that they were spending that amount of money because in the long term it was more durable than Formica and other things like that. So, um, so the, the projects do look good, but you can't have separate doors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we're at the 4.30 uh, ending point. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I hope you